Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What are the course requirements? You need a computer and internet connection to follow along with this course. Who is this course for? This course is for anyone who wants to learn something new. What is the course format? The format of the course is video. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to take a look at the installation requirements to install Oracle on a Windows computer. Here's a list of the system requirements. For operating system, you need to be on a Windows 10 computer, 64-bit processor, Windows Server 2012 release 2, 64-bit processor, or Windows Server 2016, also Windows Server 2019. You can also use virtualization. Oracle certifies the following virtualization technologies with Oracle database on Windows. So you can use Oracle VM server or Microsoft Hyper-V. For disk space, you need 8.5 gigabyte minimum for Oracle software plus two gigabyte or more for temporary storage. For RAM, you need at least two gigabyte of RAM at minimum. There are also permission requirements. You must be part of the administrator groups on Windows to be able to install Oracle Database XE. If you are logged in as a domain user, ensure that you are connected to the network before you install Oracle Database XE. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to download Oracle Database. The link to download Oracle Database is displayed on the screen. This is the download page to download Oracle Database XE. As of the time I'm recording this video, the current version is Oracle Database 21C Express Edition. So there are three links here for download. So you download the link relevant to your operating system. If you're using a Linux based system, then download from the link that says Linux. I've got a Windows computer, so I'm going to click for the link that says Windows 64. So I click on it. The download has started. You can see the download on the bottom left hand corner of my screen. It's a fairly large download. Um, it's 1.8 gigabyte in size, so it may take a while to download. The downloaded file is going to be in a zipped format. So you can see here it's got .zip, which means the files are going to be compacted. So you will need to extract the files using a software extraction tool. The icon you can see here in the download is for WinRAR. WinRAR is a software extraction tool that you can install and then use that to unzip any software that contains a zip file. If you have not got any software extraction tool on your computer, you can do a search for WinRAR on Google and then just click on the download WinRAR link here. From the download page for WinRAR, you can just download the relevant link and then install it. And that will enable you to extract the content of the Oracle database file. The download has completed, so this is a completed download. Usually it will download it to your downloads folder so this is my downloads folder and you can see this is the downloaded file. It's a zipped file so that means the content is compacted so I'll need to extract it and I'm going to extract it using WinRAR. This is the icon for WinRAR. I've already got WinRAR installed on my computer. I want to extract the downloaded file into a folder so I'm going to create a folder in this directory. So I right click and select new folder. I'm going to call it Oracle database. So I've created a new folder called Oracle database and I'm going to right click and copy the 
downloaded file into this new folder I created. I now have a copy of the downloaded file in this directory I created called Oracle Database. I'm going to go into the directory and this is a copy of the file. So to extract the file, I'll right click on it and select extract here. So it will extract the content into the folder. So we'll give it a few minutes to complete that. The content of the file has been extracted. So this is the extracted content in this directory that I created. In this video, I downloaded Oracle database and also extracted the content of the downloaded file. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to install Oracle. In the previous video, I downloaded and extracted the Oracle database files into a folder I created called Oracle database. I'm going to open the folder and run the setup.exe file. Double click on the setup.exe file. You may get the user account control dialog box pop up. Click on the yes button to continue. Click next then accept the license agreement and click next again accept the default installation directory and click on the next button enter and confirm a database password that will be used for the sys the system and pdbs admin accounts once you have entered and confirmed the password click on the next button check the details on the summary screen are correct then click on the install button please note that the installation process can take a while depending on your system's configuration and resources so please be patient you may get a windows defender firewall message pop-up click allow access to continue the installation is now completed the final installation screen also displays the connection strings to connect to the database on your computer you can click on the finish button to exit the setup screen hello and welcome to this video what is sql plus SQL Plus is a command line tool that you use to interact with Oracle database. It comes pre-installed when you install Oracle database. You can use it to start and shut down the Oracle database. You can use it to create and manage database users. You can use it to alter database objects like tables and indexes. You can also use it to insert, update and delete data. You can use it to run queries on the database and you can use it to connect to both local and remote database. A local database is the one that's installed on your computer while a remote database is a database that you connect to that is located in another computer or a network. To launch the SQL Plus, you look into your Oracle installation folder. So this is mine. And if I expand that, you should see an option for SQL Plus. I'm going to click on that and it will give me this and is asking for a username. So username when you installed Oracle, it gives you it gave you a variety of usernames you can use. One of them was called System. So I'm going to use System. I press Enter, and the password would be the password you set during the installation of the Oracle database. So I've entered my password. I'm going to press Enter, and if you are successful, it tells you here you are connected to the Oracle Database 18C Express Edition. It tells you the release number as well. All right, so once you see this, 
it means you have successfully connected to the Oracle database. So from this SQL plus, you can interact with the Oracle database and perform a variety of database operations. You can also run queries. Say, I, let's say I want to check for all the usernames. I can just type in this query, which is select star from all underscore users. And you end that with a semicolon. I'm using uppercase here, but you don't necessarily have to use uppercase. So if I press enter, that will give me all the users in this database. So you can see here, it's giving me a list of different types of users. So there are different commands you can run on this SQL plus to interact with the Oracle database. So that is it for this quick introduction to SQL plus. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to connect to the Oracle database server using SQL plus. SQL plus is an Oracle database command line interface utility. It is commonly used by administrators and programmers to interact with the Oracle database. SQL plus is installed when you install Oracle. To access the SQL plus, go to your start menu and then look for the Oracle folder. It's going to be called Aura DB21 Home 1. Click on the drop down and there should be an icon for SQL plus. So click on SQL plus. You are prompted to enter a username. Whoever installed the Oracle database will automatically have the system DBA privileges and does not need to connect to the Oracle database using a password. To connect to the database as a system DBA, just do a slash space and then type in as sysdba and press enter and that should connect. You can see it says connected to Oracle database 21C Express Edition. The next thing I want to do is to get a list of pluggable databases. To get a list of pluggable databases in the system, the command you need to type is select space name from v dollar sign p dbs and then you add a colon and then press enter and that will display all the pluggable databases xapdb1 is a pluggable database a pluggable database which is also known as pdb is a portable collection of schemas schema objects and non-schema objects that appear to an Oracle client. To connect to the pluggable database, you type in connect space sys slash the password that you specified during the installation of the Oracle database at localhost, if you have it installed on your local machine, colon, the port number slash xcpbdb1 space as space sysdba colon and press enter and you should get a message saying connected. In this video, I connected to the Oracle database using SQL plus. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to start and shut down the Oracle database server using the Windows services. Do a search for services on your Windows startup search bar and then click on the services app. When the services app launches, scroll down until you see the Oracle service XE. Click on it to select it 
at the moment the status says it is running if you want to stop it just right click on it and then click stop and if it's not running the start option should be bold and you should be able to click on it to start it so let me give you a quick demo so i'm going to stop it it's currently running i'll right click and select stop and it is trying to stop it so we'll give it a few minutes to stop that so it has stopped if you see here it doesn't say it's running anymore so i want to start it again i right click and click on start and that should restart the database server so that's it for this video in this video i showed you how to start and stop the oracle database server thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this video what is sql developer sql developer is a free graphical user interface it allows database users and administrators to perform a variety of database related tasks it is also a productivity tool its main objective is to help the end user save time and also maximize the return on investment in the Oracle database technology stack. SQL Developer also supports earlier versions of Oracle database like version 10G, 11G and 12C. SQL Developer will run on any operating system that supports Java. Let's take a look at some of the uses for SQL Developer. Developers can use SQL Developers to run queries, store procedures, test. They can also use it to document database programs and other related tasks. Database administrators can use SQL Developer to manage their databases and perform a variety of administrative tasks such as backup, security and so on. Application architects and data modelers can use SQL developers for data modeling, for scripting, reporting and a variety of other tasks. Web developers and administrators can use SQL developer to administer Oracle REST data services for creating and altering RESTful services. Oracle SQL Developer integrates with Oracle Apex, which allows you to browse applications and perform other application express activities. With Oracle SQL Developer, you can browse, you can export, you can import, you can drop or deploy applications. SQL Developer is a very useful tool to have. It improves your productivity when you're working on Oracle databases. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to download Oracle SQL Developer. The link to download Oracle SQL Developer is displayed on the screen. This is the web page to download Oracle SQL Developer. Click on the download SQL Developer button. You're then redirected to the download page. So depending on your operating system, select the relevant download link. I'm on a Windows computer. I'm going to download this link here which includes the JDK. JDK basically stands for Java Development Kit. So I'm going to click on that link. You will get a pop-up. So make sure you check to accept the license and then click on the download SQL Developer. You must have an account on Oracle before it will allow you to download if you don't have an account you'll be presented with the login and registration screen so make sure you sign in before you can download so i've already signed in so i'm going to click on the download link 
and you can see the download has started for me on the bottom left hand corner of my screen so I'll give it a few minutes to complete the size is 439 megabytes the download has completed so this is my downloads directory and this is the downloaded file the file is a compact file so it is zipped so you need to extract the content so I'm going to extract the content using WinRAR so I right click and select extract here and it will extract the content into my downloads folder the content of the downloaded file has been extracted into this folder called SQL developer so I'm going to open the folder so this is the content of the SQL developer to use the SQL developer all you need to do is click on the SQL developer application file it doesn't require installation you just click on it if you want to make things easy you can create a shortcut to this on your desktop so I'm going to right click on it and then I'm going to send it to my desktop and create a shortcut so this is the shortcut I created to the SQL developer so anytime I want to use it I just click on the shortcut and that will launch the SQL developer so you can see it's trying to load the SQL developer if this is the first time you are running the SQL developer you may get this message about importing references from previous SQL developer installation I'm going to click no to that this is what the Oracle SQL developer interface looks like so I'm going to exit I'll click file and exit anytime I want to launch it I've already created a shortcut on my desktop I'll just double click on it to launch the SQL developer in this video I downloaded Oracle SQL developer thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this video in this video I'm going to connect SQL developer to Oracle to begin I'm going to launch the SQL developer I've got a shortcut on my desktop so I just double click to launch it I'm going to create a new connection so here on that connection I click on the plus sign in the new select database connection dialog box you need to give the connection a name I'm going to call it system I've given the connection a name of system and the username should be system or lowercase the password should be the password that you specified during the installation of the Oracle database so enter that password in here I've entered my password the connection details should be auto populated so for the host name you should have localhost the port number should be 1521 the seed should be XE next I need to enter the service name so I'm going to click on the radio button for the service name the service name would have been provided when the installation of the Oracle database was completed the service name should be XEPDB1 so let's test the connection so there is a test button here so I'm going to click on it to test the connection if everything is successful we should get a message so you can see here we have status success I'm going to click to connect we have successfully connected to the database and we can see some database objects displayed I'm going to run a quick query that will enable us to see the metadata tables so I've typed in this query select star from tab and that will enable me to see the metadata tables so I'm going to click to execute it so the query has returned some results so these are the metadata tables in this video I connected to the Oracle database using SQL developer thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this video in this video I'm going to download the Oracle sample schemas link 
to download the sample schemas is displayed on the screen. This is the web page to download the Oracle Database 21C sample schemas. There are two files, they both do the same thing. So you can download the source code.zip file or the source code.tar file. I'm going to be downloading the source code.zip file. So I'll click on it. I've clicked on the source code.zip so you can see it being downloaded on the bottom left hand corner of my screen. I'm going to right click on the downloaded file and select extract here to extract the content. The content is going to be extracted into my downloads folder. The content has been downloaded into a folder called DB sample schema and this is the content. The downloaded schema folder has to be placed in a specified directory where Oracle will look for it. This is the default location where Oracle will look for your schemas provided you installed Oracle in the default location. I'm going to copy the downloaded schema directory into where Oracle looks for it. So I go to my computer, click on the app directory, my username product 21C and then look for DB Home XE. Inside there, there should be a folder called demo. So I click on the demo folder. Inside demo, there should be a schema folder. And inside that schema folder is where I copy the downloaded schema directory. So that's it for this video. In this video, I downloaded the sample Oracle database schemas. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to unlock the sample HR schema account. I will be using the SQL developer to unlock the sample HR schema. So I'm going to open the SQL developer and then connect to it using my system account. So any connections you have will be listed on the Oracle connections. So this is a connection I have for system account. So I click on the plus sign to log in. So I just enter my password. I've entered my password. So I click OK. I have connected to the database using my system account. Next, I'm going to go to where the schemas are stored in the Oracle database. So this is the location. I'm going to open up the schema folder. So this is the schema folder. So I'm going to click to open it. We have different schemas in this DB sample schema folder. And the schema I want to unlock is the human resources schema. So I'm going to click to open it. There are different script files in this folder. There's 10 in total. I'm going to be using this script file, which is called HR underscore main. I'm going to execute this script file inside my SQL developer. And this will enable me to unlock the sample HR schema account. So I'm going to copy the path here into my SQL developer. So I right click, I copy and I'll paste it into my SQL developer. So I click on paste. So this is the actual path to where the schema is stored. So I'm going to add the name of the script file. So I'll do a slash. So I've added the name of the script file, which is hr underscore main dot SQL. Before I can execute this script, I have to add the at symbol at the beginning of the path. I've added the at symbol at the beginning of the path to execute this script. I click on the play button here. You'll be given an option to specify the password for the HR as parameter one. 
So you need to enter the value for the parameter one. So I'm going to type in HR. So I've entered the value HR as the password. So I'll click OK. Next, I need to supply a value for the default table space for HR. So here I need to enter the value for the parameter two. I'm going to call it users. I've entered the value of users for the default table space. So I click OK. The next option is to specify a temporary table space for HR as parameter three. I'm going to enter a value as temp. So I click OK. Next, we need to specify the password for the sys as parameter four. When you install the Oracle database, you would have been prompted for a password. So that is the password you need to specify. I've entered the password, so I'm going to click OK. Next, I have to specify a log path as parameter five. The value is going to be the path where the log is stored, which is stored in the schema directory inside the demo directory. So click OK to that. Next, we need to specify a connection string as parameter six. So I'm going to enter the value here. I've entered the value of localhost colon 1521 slash XEPDB1. I'm going to click OK. The script has executed successfully and we can see the user HR has been created and the user HR has been altered. Altered basically means we've also provided a password for that user account. In this video, I unlocked the sample HR schema account. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to unlock the sample HR schema tables. I'm going to use the SQL developer to unlock the sample HR schema tables. So I'm going to click to launch the SQL developer. I'm going to connect to the Oracle database using the HR schema account. I've already created a connection setting for it. It's called HR. So I'm going to click to sign in to the account. I'm just going to enter my password to connect to the database. I've entered my password. I click OK to check if I have any tables listed in my HR schema. I'm going to execute this query, which is select star from tab. And that will return any tables I have in the HR schema. So I'm going to click on the play button to execute the query. The query has returned nothing. This is the location where the sample database schemas are stored in Oracle. So I'm going to open up the folder and I'm going to open up the human underscore resources folder, which is the HR. There are 10 script files located in the human resources folder. I'm going to execute all the script I have highlighted. I'm going to copy the location of the script files. So I'm going to select this. So this is the location of my script files. So I'm going to copy that and then execute the queries I want. These are the SQL script. I'm going to execute inside my SQL developer that will unlock the sample HR schema tables. Each of these script files includes the add symbol and the location where the script is located, followed by the script name .sql. I've copied the location of the script into the SQL developer query editor. So I'm going to execute all of them together. So I need to click on the second play button here, the smaller one that enables me to execute everything 
inside the query editor. So I'm going to click on it and you can see it's executing the queries and it's creating the relevant tables. So we'll give it a few minutes to execute. As you can see, it's going through each of the script line by line and executing the content of the script. All the scripts specified have been successfully executed. If we right click on the tables folder inside the HR connection settings, click on refresh and that will refresh. You can see now the table folder has been refreshed. You can see we now have the following tables inside the HR schema unlocked. If I execute this command again, select star from tab, it will show all the tables from the HR schema. So you can see these are the eight tables that have been unlocked from the sample HR schema. I have typed in a query to return all the data stored in the table called employees. So I'm using select star basically means return all the columns and all the rows from the table called employees. So I'm going to click to execute. So in the output here is the data stored in the table called employees. So we have a total of 107 records returned by this query. So that's it for this video. In this video, I unlocked the sample tables belonging to the HR schema. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to connect to Oracle using the sample HR account. I've got SQL Developer opened. I'm going to create a new connection for the HR account. So I click on the green plus icon here and this gives me the new database connection dialog box. I'm going to give the connection a name. I'm going to call it HR. I've given the connection a name. I've called it HR in uppercase. The username for the HR account is HR in lowercase. Next, I need to enter the password for the HR account. The password for the HR account is also HR. Post name, the pot number, the seed has been auto populated. I need to enter a value for the service name. So make sure you click on the service name radio button and then enter the value for the service name. I have entered a value for the service name. The value is XEPDB1. I'm going to test the connection. I'll click on test. The test has generated a status of success. So I'm going to click to connect. I have now connected to the database using the HR account. In this video, I connected to the Oracle database using the HR account. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to this video. What is PL slash SQL? PL stands for procedural language extensions to the structured query language, which is known as SQL. SQL is a powerful language for querying and updating data in a relational database. Oracle created PL slash SQL to extend some limitations of the SQL language in order to provide a more comprehensive solution for building mission critical applications running on Oracle database. Oracle developed the PL slash SQL to enhance the capabilities of SQL. So it's basically the procedural extension to the SQL language. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to explain 
the PL slash SQL block structure. PL slash SQL program units organize the code into blocks. A block without a name is referred to as an anonymous block. The anonymous block is the simplest unit in PL slash SQL. It is referred to as the anonymous block because it is not saved in the Oracle database. An anonymous block is an only one time use and is useful in certain situations such as creating test units. This is an example of a PL slash SQL block structure. A typical anonymous block structure has three basic sections. We have the declaration, which is an optional section. We have the execution section. This section is mandatory. And then we have the exception handling section, which is also an optional section. The declaration section is an optional section. It allows you to define data types, structures, and variables. So within the declaration section, you can declare your variables, you can give the variable names, you can add data types, and you can also initialize values for your variables. The execution section starts with a begin keyword and ends with an end keyword. It is a mandatory section. In the execution section is where you write the logic for your program. Also, the execution section must have at least one statement. You can use both procedural and SQL statements inside the execution section. We have the exception section, which starts with the keyword exception. This section is an optional section. It is used to handle the exceptions that occurs during the execution section. Every PL slash SQL statement is followed by a semicolon. Also, you can nest PL slash SQL blocks. Notice that the single forward slash is a signal to instruct the SQL plus to execute the PL slash SQL block. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to be executing a PL SQL variable assignment block using SQL Developer. I have launched the Oracle SQL Developer. I'm going to log in to my HR schema. So my username is HR. So I'm just going to type in the password. I've typed in the password. So I'm going to click OK. And that will connect me to the HR schema. The first thing I want to do is to view the structure of a table in the HR schema. I'm going to use this command called describe, followed by the name of the table. I want to view the structure for, which is called employees. So I'm going to click on this green button here, and that will execute that command. Below here is the output generated by executing the above command. So on that type, we can see the various data types that are being used by each of the columns in the table. So we have the column names here, and then we have on the type, the data type that each of the column is expected to receive. I have added this block of code here to query the employees table and return some data. So I'm going to be querying the employee ID, the last underscore name, and the salary from the employees table. And I'm going to specify a condition on line number five here. I'm using the where clause to specify a condition 
that will only return data that matches the criteria. And the criteria is, I only want to return the records where the salary is greater than 12,000. I only want to execute the query I have selected. So I'm going to click on the button here, the green button to execute. So this is the output of executing the above query here. So these are eight records in that table that matches the criteria I set. So you can see all their salaries are above 12,000. This is a script that I've prepared that I'm going to execute. In this script, I'm using the select statement to assign values to the variables that I have declared. On line number one, I have set the server output to on using the set command. And I've also set a value for the size. If you don't set a size value, it uses the default size. Line number three to line number six are variables that I have declared inside the declare section of the PL SQL block. The first variable on line number three is called V underscore first underscore name. When you declare variable, you also have to specify the type of data that that variable is going to store. So I'm doing that using this percent type. So this percent type is going to use the data type from the first underscore name column from the employees table. Variables on line number four, five, and six will also be getting their data types from the columns within the employees table. In the begin section, I'm using the select statement to select these columns from the employees table. The employee underscore ID, the first underscore name, the last underscore name, and the higher underscore date. So we're using the select to select these columns from the employees table after the select statement selects the columns from the employee table on line number 12 i'm using the into clause to assign the values from those selected columns into the variables on line number 12 13 14 and 16. so these variables that were declared in the declare section are going to get the values from the select statement. And the select statement is going to get that value from line number 16, which is from the employees table. And we want to be specific because we don't want to get all the employee data. We only want to retrieve data where the employee ID is equals to 205 which I have specified on line number 17. On line number 19 to 21, I'm using the procedure called dbms underscore output dot put underscore line. We're using that to display the values of the variables. I'm going to import the script I've prepared into SQL Developer. So I'll go to file, I'll go open, I browse to the folder, the name of the script file is called variable-assignment. I click to open. I've now opened up the script file. So I'm going to click on the little green button here and click OK. The script has been executed. You can see the output here. So the value of the first underscore first name is called Shirley. The last name is called Higgins and the higher date is the 7th of June. So I've successfully executed the PLSQL block. In this video, I executed a PLSQL variable assigned block using SQL Developer. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. In PLSQL, a variable is a meaningful name of a temporary storage location 
that supports a particular data type in a program. Before using a variable, you need to declare the variable first inside the declaration section of a PL SQL block. Let's take a look at the PL SQL variable naming rules. There are some variable naming rules that you need to be aware of when creating variables. The variable names must be less than 31 characters and it's always advisable to give your variable a meaningful name which should be within the 31 characters limit. A variable name must begin with an axial letter followed by any number or an underscore. It can also be followed by a dollar sign. It can either be lowercase or uppercase. PL SQL is case sensitive. So for example, if you have a variable that has a name lowercase v underscore data and you refer to it with uppercase v underscore capital data, you're referring to the same variable. It is recommended that you follow the naming conventions listed in the table displayed to make the variables obvious in the PL SQL programs. Each organization has its own development naming convention guidelines. Make sure you comply with your organization's naming convention guidelines. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to show you how to declare variables. We have to declare variables inside the declaration section in a PL SQL block or in a package as a global variable. After the declaration of the variables, PL SQL allocates memory for the variable and the variable name is used to identify the storage location. Here is some example variables I have declared inside the declaration section of a PL SQL block. To declare a variable, you use the variable name followed by the data type and then you terminate it with a semicolon. So in this example here, I've got the variable name, which is V underscore first underscore name, followed by the data type, which is a varchar two. When you declare variable, you can also explicitly add a length constraint to the data type within the parentheses. So here I've added a constraint of 20, which means the length of the variable cannot be more than 20. So in these examples, I've declared four variables, v underscore first underscore name, v underscore last underscore name, n underscore employee underscore ID number, and d underscore hire underscore date. In the date variable, we have the date as the data type. In the employee variable, we have the number as the data type. And in the last name variable, we have voucher two as the data type. So in this example, I have declared some variables inside the PL SQL anonymous block. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to explain PL SQL variable assignment. In PL SQL, to assign a value or a variable to another variable, you can use the assignment operator. So the assignment operator is basically a colon followed by an equals to sign. Here's an example of how variable assignment works. So when you are creating variables in a PL SQL block, the variables have to be declared in the declaration section. So in the example on the screen, I have four variables that have been defined. 
the first variable is called v underscore first underscore name. When you declare a variable, you also have to specify the type of data that the variable is going to store. In this example, I'm going to use the data type that is stored in the table called employees. And in that table called employees, there's a column called first underscore name. So I'm using the type here to specify that I want to use the data type that this column, which is called first underscore name in this table called employees, I'm going to use whatever data type that this column use. I'm going to use that for this variable, which is called V underscore first name. The same step applies to the second variable, which is V underscore last name. And then we have this variable N underscore employee ID. Again, I'm going to be using the type, which is a data type of the employee underscore ID column from the employees table. In the last variable, which is called D underscore higher underscore date, I'm using the data type from the higher underscore date column in the employees table. In the begin part of the code block is where we actually assign the values. So for example, this variable called V underscore first underscore name, I'm using the assignment operator for variables, which is the colon and then the equals two. We're using that to assign a value of Mary to the first underscore name variable. And then in the V underscore last name variable, again, we're using the variable assignment to assign a value Jane to the V underscore last underscore name variable. Similarly, on this variable called D underscore higher underscore date, I'm using the variable assignment. So basically what this is going to do is going to assign this function, which is called two underscore date. And this is the value of the function we are going to assign this to this variable called D underscore higher underscore date. You can use SQL statements inside your PL SQL block. So you can use the into of the select statement to assign a value to a variable. The into clause basically moves the values from the select queries column list into the corresponding PLSQL variables. So if we take a look at the begin part of the block, we have the SQL query where we're selecting the employee underscore ID, the first underscore name, the last underscore name, the higher underscore date. Okay. And then we're using the into clause to move those values into the variable. So we have the N underscore employee ID, the V underscore first name, V underscore last name, and D underscore higher underscore date. And the table we are targeting is the employees table. And from the employees table, we are targeting a specific employee with the employee ID when this PLSQL block is executed, it will display the first name, the last name and the higher date on the screen. In this video, I showed you how to assign variables using the variable assignment operator. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to take a look at PLSQL variable anchors. In PL SQL program, one of the most common tasks is to select values from columns in a table into a set of variables. In case the data types of the columns 
of the table changes, you have to also change the PL SQL program to make the types of the variables compatible with the new changes in the data types. PL SQL provides you with a very useful feature which is called variable anchors. Variable anchors refers to the use of the percent type keyword. The percent type keyword declares a variable with the data type that it is associated with within a column's data type of a particular column in a table. I have connected to the Oracle database using Toad and I'm going to take a look at the structure of the employees table within the HR sample database schema provided by Oracle. I've already connected to the HR schema so I'm going to use this command here describe space employees so this command will display the structure of the employees table so to execute this command I'm going to click on the play button here this is the structure of the employees table in the HR schema so we have the names of the column on this side we have the ID the data types you can see we have the data types displayed for each of the column here is an example of variable anchors if we take a look at the first variable which is v underscore first underscore name this variable has a data type that is the same as the data type of the first underscore name column in the employees table so if we take a look at the employees table we can see that the first underscore name column has the data type of voucher 2 it also has the 20 byte constraint which means that the total length of the first name that is going to be supplied cannot be more than 20 bytes in character that means the size is restricted to 20. If for any reason the data type for the first underscore name column changes the type of the V underscore first name in the example will automatically inherit the new data type of the column. So in the example here where we have v underscore first name if the data type in the database changes this will automatically also change by having the percent type here it means that any time the data type changes in the column inside the database it will also automatically change here hello and welcome to this video in this video I'm going to be executing a PL SQL variable assignment block using SQL Developer. I have launched the Oracle SQL Developer. I'm going to log in to my HR schema. So my username is HR so I'm just going to type in the password. I've typed in the password so I'm going to click OK and that will connect me to the HR schema. The first thing I want to do is to view the structure of a table in the HR schema. I'm going to use this command called describe followed by the name of the table I want to view the structure for which is called employees. So I'm going to click on this green button here and that will execute that command. Below here is the output generated by executing the above command so on that type we can see the various data types that are being used by each of the columns in the table so we have the column names here 
and then we have on that type the data type that each of the column is expected to receive. I have added this block of code here to query the employees table and return some data. So I'm going to be querying the employee ID, the last underscore name and the salary from the employees table and I'm going to specify a condition on line number five here I'm using the where clause to specify a condition that will only return data that matches the criteria and the criteria is I only want to return the records where the salary is greater than 12,000. I only want to execute the query I have selected so I'm going to click on the button here the green button to execute so this is the output of executing the above query here so these are eight records in that table that matches the criteria I set so you can see all their salaries are above 12,000. This is a script that I've prepared that I'm going to execute. In this script I'm using the select statement to assign values to the variables that I have declared. On line number one I have set the server output to on using the set command and I've also set a value for the size. If you don't set a size value it uses the default size. Line number three to line number six are variables that I have declared inside the declare section of the PLSQL block. The first variable on line number three is called v underscore first underscore name. When you declare variable you also have to specify the type of data that that variable is going to store. So I'm doing that using this percent type. So this percent type is going to use the data type from the first underscore name column from the employees table. Variables on line number four, five and six will also be getting their data types from the columns within the employees table. In the begin section I'm using the select statement to select these columns from the employees table. The employee underscore ID, the first underscore name, the last underscore name and the higher underscore date. So we're using the select to select these columns from the employees table after the select statement selects the columns from the employee table on line number 12 I'm using the into clause to assign the values from those selected columns into the variables on line number 12, 13, 14 and 16. So these variables that were declared in the declare section are going to get the values from the select statement. And the select statement is going to get that value from line number 16 which is from the employees table and we want to be specific because we don't want to get all the employee data. We only want to retrieve data where the employee ID is equals to 205 which I have specified on line number 17. On line number 19 to 21 I'm using the procedure called dbms underscore output dot put underscore line. We're using that to display the values of the variables. I'm going to import the script I've prepared into SQL Developer. So I'll go to file, I'll go open, I browse to the folder, the name of the script file is called variable dash assignment. I click to open. I've now opened up the script file so I'm going to click on the little green button here and click OK. The script has been executed. You can see the output here. 
So the value of the first underscore first name is called Shirley. The last name is called Higgins. And the higher date is the 7th of June. So I've successfully executed the PLSQL block. In this video, I executed a PLSQL variable assigned block using SQL Developer. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to be initializing variables in PLSQL. When we declare a variable, PLSQL assigns it a null as a default value. That means its value is uninitialized. A field with no value is referred to as null. You can initialize a variable value in the declaration section by using a variable assignment. On the illustration on the right, I have a sample variable declaration. So in the declaration section, I have declared three variables. On the variable on line number four and five, I have assigned values to the variables using the variable assignment operator. The variables on line number four and five are initialized. The variable on line number six is not initialized at declaration. However, in the begin section of the block, I have assigned value to the variable on line number six. And the value is going to be the value of variable one plus the value of variable two. On line number 10, I'm using the procedure which is called dbms underscore output dot put underscore line to display the value of variable three. I have got Oracle SQL developer open. So I'm going to connect to the system account. So I'm going to click on the plus sign next to system. I'm going to enter the password for my system account. I've entered the password. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to open up my script file. So I click on file and then open. So I've got my script file open. So I'm going to select the script file, which is called initializing dash variables. I'll click open to execute the script. I'm going to click on the green button and then click OK. The script has successfully executed. We can see the result in the output. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to initialize variable in PLSQL. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to PLSQL literals. Literals is an explicit numeric character, string or Boolean value which are not represented by identifiers. Let's take a look at the types of literals in PLSQL. We have numeric literals, we have character literals, we have string literals, we have Boolean literals, we have date and time literals. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to be exploring variable scopes in PLSQL. PLSQL allows the nesting of blocks. That means you can nest PLSQL blocks within other PLSQL blocks. Based on the nesting structure of PLSQL, variables can be divided into two scopes. The first is the local variable scope. The local variable scope are basically variables which are declared in the inner block and are not accessible to the outer blocks. Next, we have the global variable scope. The global variable scope are variables which are declared in the outer block or a package and are accessible to itself and inner blocks. So basically, local variables can only be accessed within the scope in which they are declared within that specific block. While global scopes can be accessed from anywhere within the blocks. Let's take a look at this script that I have written. So inside the script, I have declared some global variables. So global variables are usually declared in the outer block or a package. With a global variable declaration, you can access the variables from any blocks within 
the PLC code blocks. So I've declared two global variables on line number five and six, and I've also initialized the variables. And then in the begin section, I've got two outputs that are going to be displayed. Notice that on line number eight and nine, I've used the pipe operator. The pipe operator is used to concatenate two or more strings together. I've got another block within this PLC equal block. On line number 10 here, I'm declaring some local variables. So this is an inner block and inside that inner block, I've got two variables declared and initialized. In the begin section of the inner block on line 15 to 18, I'm using the procedure called dbms underscore output dot put underscore line. I'm using that to display various text as an output. So the message that's going to be displayed is enclosed in the parentheses. You can assess global variables from anywhere within your PSQL blocks, regardless of how nested they are. While local variables can only be assessed within the local block, in which it has been declared. I have connected to my Oracle server using SQL developer system account. So I've also imported the script. So this is the script I'm going to execute. So to execute the script, I'll click on the little green button here and then click OK. So the script has been executed. We can see the script output on the bottom here. In this video, I introduce you to variable scopes in PLSQL. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to the introduction to PLSQL functions. PLSQL functions are named PLSQL blocks, which performs one or more specific task and must return a value. A PLSQL function is also called a sub routine or a sub program. To create a PLSQL function, you can use the following syntax displayed on the screen. Let me walk you through the syntax. You can specify the function name after the keyword function. By convention, the function name should start with a verb. For example, convert underscore to underscore number. A function can have zero or more than one parameter. A parameter basically is a placeholder for a variable. You can usually specify your parameters enclosed in square brackets. For example, parameter underscore one, parameter underscore two, and so on. When you specify a parameter, you also have to specify the data type for each parameter. This has to be specified explicitly. Each parameter has one of three modes. So you have the in, the out, and the in out. The in parameter is a read only parameter the function cannot change the value of the in parameter. The out parameter is a write only parameter. It can be used to return values back to the calling program. The out parameter is initialized to a default value of its own type when the function begins, regardless of its original value before it is being passed to the function. Also, the function can change the value of the out parameter. The in out parameters are read and write parameters. That is a function can read and change the in out parameter value and also return it back to the calling program. A function must have at least one return statement in the execution section. The return clause in the function header specifies 
the data type of the return value. The block structure of a function is similar to that of an anonymous block. The only difference is that it has an additional section for the function header. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to create PL SQL functions. I'm going to be creating a couple of functions. The syntax for the first function is displayed on the screen. This function is going to be called try underscore pass. And this function is going to be used to pass a string. A string basically is a text. So it's going to be used to pass a string and it will return a number. If the input string is a number or it will return a null value if it cannot convert the value into a number. The IV underscore number is an in parameter whose data type is varchar2 so that you can pass any string to the try underscore pass function. Inside the function, I've used the built-in PLSQL function, which is called to underscore number. This function is used to convert a string into a number. If any exception error occurs, the function is going to return a null value in the exception section. Otherwise, it will return a number. The PLSQL function returns a value, so you can use it on the right-hand side of an assignment or in a select statement. I'm going to create an anonymous block to use the try underscore pass function. So this is the anonymous block that I'm going to create that is going to be used to execute the try underscore pass function. So in the anonymous block, I've declared some variables, but I have not initialized them inside the declaration section. The variables are initialized in the begin section of the block. Each of the variables is initialized by assigning them to the function. And we are also passing values for the functions to use in the execution. So in the output here, we are going to output the values of each of the variables. We can also use the try underscore function in a select statement as shown here. So we can select the try underscore pass function and pass it some values from dual. The dual table is a special table that only has one row. It is basically used for selecting pseudo column like the ones we have in the example. This is the syntax for the second function I'm going to create. The name of the function is called get multiple and the function has multiple parameters. The parameters are called num1 and it has a data type of number and we also have a parameter of num2 with a data type of number. We also have a return statement, which is going to return a number. I've got a variable called num3, and the data type that's going to store is a number, and the digits that is going to accept the maximum digit is eight. In the begin statement, I've initialized the num3 variable. I've assigned it to variable number one times variable number two, and that will return a new value for variable number three. So there are various ways I can execute this function. So a function basically returns a value that can be assigned to a variable. 
So here we have a value called result and it's going to be assigned to the function which is called get multiple and we are passing it the four and five which basically are the parameters. Notice when the function was defined, we have two parameters, num1 and num2. So they are just placeholders. So here now we are giving it value. So in the result, get multiple, we're passing in a value for the first parameter, which is num1, we gave it four. And the second parameter, which is num2, I've given it a value of five. You can also execute a function as part of a select statement. For example, here we have select the name of the function, the parameters from dual. Dual basically is a special table in Oracle. A dual table in Oracle only has one row. It is mainly used for selecting pseudo column like the one we have in the example. You can also execute a function as a PL SQL statement. For example, here we are outputting the function and the parameters supplied. You can drop a function by typing in the word drop function followed by the name of the function. I've connected to the Oracle database using Oracle SQL Developer. So I'm going to import the first script that will create the first function. To import the script, I'll click on File and then click on Open. The name of the script is called parse-function.sql. So I click to Open and that opens up the script inside the Query Builder. To execute the script, I'm going to click on the little green button here and click OK. So we have a message in the script output to say the function has been compiled. Next, I'm going to create an anonymous block that will be used to execute this function. So I'm going to import the script. So I click File and click Open. And the name of the script is called Pass-Anonymous. I click Open. To execute the script, I click on the little green button and click OK and that will execute the script. So I've used this anonymous block to call and execute this function. And you can see the output of the function being displayed. We have two values for two of the variables which are numerical. The value for the third variable is not numerical. That is why it has not been displayed in the script output because in the function declaration I specified I only wanted to return numerical values. You can also execute a function inside a select statement. So on line number 18 here I've added the select statement which is going to be executed from this table called dual. So I'm going to select that line of statement and then execute it and we can see the value inside the script output. I've added another select statement on line number 20 and I'm going to try and execute that and you can see that it has returned null as specified in the function declaration. So when I declare the function I did say if it is not a numerical value that is returned it should return null. So that's why it has returned null. I'm going to add the script to create the second function. So I click on file and then open. The name of the script is called get multiple dash function dot SQL. So I click open to create a function from this script. I click on the little green button and that will execute the script. So I'm going to select the connection which is system. I click OK and that has executed. So you can see here it says function get multiple compiled which means the function has been created. I'm going to create an anonymous block and use that to execute this function. So I've already prepared the script so I'm going to add it on. So I click on file open and the script I want is this one here get multiple anonymous. I click open. So you can execute a function in a variety of ways. For example a function can 
return a value that can be assigned to a variable. So you can see here in this anonymous block on line number three, I declared a variable called result with the data type of number and on line number five is where I initialize the variable by assigning it the value of the function. I'm using the statement on line number six to display the output for the value of the function. So to execute this, I click on the little green button here and then select the connection. I'll click OK. As you can see, we have the result in the output, which is 20 because you're multiplying four by five and that returns 20. You can also execute a function as part of a select statement. On line number 12, I've added the select statement where I am using the function to retrieve data from the dual table. So I'm going to execute that and that should return the numerical value. I've added another select statement on line 14. If I execute this statement, it should return a null value. So I'm going to execute it and you can see it has returned null because it is not a numerical value. You can also delete a function if you no longer require the function. So on line number 17 here, I've added a statement that you can use to delete a function. So you type in the word drop followed by the keyword function and then the name of the function. So I'm going to execute this and it should say the function has been dropped. You can see that in the output. I'm also going to drop the second function. So on line number 20, I've written the statement to drop the second function. So I'm going to execute it and we can see here it says the function get multiple has been dropped. In this video, we created some functions using Oracle SQL Developer. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to PL SQL Stored Procedure. What are PL SQL Stored Procedures? PL SQL Stored Procedures are named PL SQL blocks which performs one or more specific tasks. PL SQL procedures allows you to encapsulate complex business logic and also to reuse it in both the database layer and the application layer. A PL SQL stored procedure can be divided into two parts, the header, and the body part. The header part contains the name of the procedure and the parameters passed to the procedure. The body part contains the declaration section, the execution section, and the exception section. A PL SQL stored procedure do not return a value directly. You can pass parameters into stored procedure by using different types of mode. There are three main types of modes. We have the in parameters. These parameters basically are read only parameters and the procedure cannot change the value of the in parameters. We also have the out parameters. These parameters are the right only parameters and used to return values back to the calling program. For this parameter, the procedures can change the value of the out parameter. The final mode is the in out parameters. These parameters are read and write parameters. That is a procedure can read and also change the in out parameter value and return it back to the calling program. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be showing you how to call or execute a stored procedure. A procedure can call other procedures. Also, a procedure without parameters can be called directly by using the exec statement or execute statement followed by the name of the procedure. A procedure without parameters can be called 
using the exec or execute statement followed by the procedure's name and its parameters in the order corresponding to the parameter list of the procedure as shown in the example below. To execute or call the store procedure that we created previously, before any adjustment is made, we query the salary column from the employees table where the employee underscore ID is equals to 200. We then call the stored procedure on line number four by using the word exec followed by the name of the stored procedure. And then in the stored procedure parameters, we pass in the ID of the employee ID we want to adjust the salary for and then we add the percentage increase we want for that salary. So on line number four, I've given it a percentage increase of five. After the store procedure has been executed, we want to run another query on the salary column from the employees table where the employee ID is equals to 200 and this would give us the value after the store procedure has been executed to increase the salary by 5%. Before I execute the stored procedure, I want to query the salary column from the employees table where the employee ID is 200. So I'm going to select this script on line number one and execute that. And that tells me the current salary of employee ID 200. So this is the value before executing the stored procedure. So I'm going to select the stored procedure and when I execute the stored procedure, it's going to increase the salary by 5%. So I'm going to execute that and it says the stored procedure has been completed. So I'm going to run the select statement again to see what the new salary is after the execution of the stored procedure. I'm going to click on that and you can see the salary has changed by 5%. It has increased. So this is the new value after the execution of the stored procedure. You can also delete a stored procedure if you no longer need it. And this code here on line number seven is what you use to delete or drop a stored procedure. You start with the word drop followed by the word procedure and then the name of the procedure. So I'm going to execute that and you can see here it says the procedure has been dropped. That is deleted. So that's it for this video. In this video I showed you how to execute a stored procedure. Thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video I'm going to introduce you to the PLSQL if statement. The if statement allows you to either execute or skip a sequence of statements depending on a condition. There are three main types of if statements. We have the if then, the if then else, the if then else if. So these are the three forms of if statements. This is the syntax for the if then statement. The condition is usually a Boolean expression that always evaluates to true, false or null. If the condition evaluates to true, the statement after the then executes. Otherwise, the if statement does nothing. This is the syntax for the if then else statement. With this syntax, if the condition evaluates to true, then the statements between the then and the else executes. In case the condition evaluates to false or null, the else statements between the else and the end if statements will execute. This is the syntax for the if then else if statement. In this structure, 
the condition between the if and then which is the first condition is always evaluated each other condition between the else if and the then is evaluated only if the preceding condition is false for example the condition underscore two is evaluated only if the condition underscore one is false the condition underscore three is evaluated only if the condition underscore two is false and so on if a condition is true other subsequent conditions are not evaluated if no condition is true the else statement between the else and the end if executes in case you skip the else clause and no condition is true then the if then else if will do nothing hello and welcome to this video in this video we're going to take a look as some examples of using an if statement. This is a script that I have prepared to execute to show an example of an if then statement. In this example, the if statement is going to update the employee's salary to mid range if the employee's salary is lower than the mid range. So in the declaration section from line two to six, I have declared some variables. In the begin section, I'm getting the salary range of the employee based on their jobs. And I'm using a select statement. So line 10 is a select statement where I'm selecting the minimum underscore salary, the maximum underscore salary, and I'm inserting that value into the variable, which is called n underscore min underscore salary and n underscore max underscore salary. And we're getting this information from line number 14, which is the jobs table. On line number 15, we're using the where clause to filter the information we need. So we want where the job underscore ID is equals to a select statement. So we are using another select statement where we are selecting the job underscore ID from the employees table where the employee underscore ID is equals to the variable which is called N underscore emp underscore ID. Next, we're going to calculate the mid-range salary. To do that, on line number 20, I've declared a variable called n underscore mid underscore salary, and I've set that value to be equals to the variable called n underscore min underscore salary plus the variable called n underscore mask underscore salary and then dividing that value by two, that will give us the mid range salary. To get the salary of a given employee, I'm using a select statement from line number 22 to 25. So I'm selecting the salary and then inserting that value into the variable called N underscore salary and we're getting the value from the employees table on line number 25 we're using the where clause so where the employee underscore id is equals to the value of the variable called n underscore emp underscore id once we've done that we want to update the employee salary if the employee salary is lower than the mid range salary. So to do that, we're using an update statement. On line number 29, I'm using the if statement. So I'm saying if the variable called n underscore salary is less than the variable called n underscore mid underscore salary, then we will update 
the employees table and set the salary to equals to the variable called n underscore mid underscore salary where the employee underscore id is equals to the value of the variable called n underscore emp underscore id and then on line number 33 we end the if statement this is the script i'm going to execute to show an example of the if then else statement i'm going to use the if then else statement to update the employee's salary if the employee's salary is lower than the mid range otherwise i will increase it by five percent i have slightly modified the previous script that i explained to include the condition for the if then else statement so from line number 29 to line number 36 is the updates that i have made to the previous script so we're basically checking if the variable called n underscore salary is greater than the variable called n underscore mid underscore salary if it is then we will update the specified employees table and set the salary to equals to the n underscore mid underscore salary where the specified employee id is equals to the value stored in this variable called n underscore emp underscore id if that condition is not true we'll jump onto the else statement on line 33 and then update the employees table and set the salary to equals to the salary plus the salary multiplied by five percent which is five divided by a hundred that will give you five percent and it will add five percent to the salary if the specified employee salary is lower than the mid range salary this is the script that i prepared to show an example of the if then else if statement this script is going to print out the corresponding messages when the employee salary is higher than the mid range also when the employee salary is lower than the mid range or when the employee salary is equal to the mid range so you can see here i've got the print out statement here in the dbms underscore output so they will print out various messages based on the employee salary i've connected to the oracle database sample hr schema using oracle sql developer before i execute the script for the if statement i want to quickly query the salary column from the employees table where the employee id is 200 so i want to check what the current salary is for this employee so i'm going to execute this query we can see the current salary for this employee id of 200 is 4620 i'm going to import the script i've prepared for the if then statement i've browsed to my scripts folder and this is a script i want to execute it's called if then i'll select it and click open to execute the script i'm going to click on the little green button here and accept the connection i'll click ok it tells you the script has been successfully completed i'm going to run this query again just to query the salary i'll click to execute and you can see the salary has not changed after the execution of the if then statement next i've added the script for the if then else statement what this script is going to do is going to update the employee's salary if the salary is lower than the mid range 
it will increase it by 5%. So the employee ID I'm targeting here is employee ID of 200. To execute the script, I'm going to click on the little green button here. I'm going to accept the connection. I can see the script has been executed. I'm going to query the salary column from the employees table where the employee ID is 200. I'm going to click on the green button here to execute. And if we take a look at the salary, notice that the salary has changed after the execution of the if then else statement. You can see that the salary was updated by 5%. I've added the script for the if then else if statement. What this statement is basically going to do, it is going to print out a message based on the current employee ID to print out if the salary is higher than the mid range, lower than the mid range or equal to the mid range. So I'm going to execute it by clicking on the little green button here. I'm going to accept the connection and you can see we have a message. It says the employee ID of 200 has a salary of 4,851, which is higher than the mid range salary of 4,500. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you an example of using if statements. Thank you for watching.